the biggest piece of advice I would probably give is don't believe all that you see because most of what we see online is magical and perfect and lovely you know I said don't believe all of that you know it's not real and um, but like what I say to my own self really is that you know as you are is absolutely fine funny one this question because I've got two definitions of it so my old traditional high performance definition would about would have been about achieving succeeding doing well doing better and I think that was all driven against you know growing up in a working class area having a pretty tough time as a kid so it was always about proving that I was good enough and I did that pretty well you know I achieved did well at school you know qualified did well in my career but when I look back on it now my definitions changed a lot. So now I'd probably say high performance is about doing what I do, but doing it for the right reasons. And, you know, following what's right for me, kind of, you know, looking at what my work is, why I do it, what's the purpose of what I do, but not actually seeking any validation or not doing it to feel better or to look better. So I think it, it plays out in two ways for me. And probably the best way I can describe it is when I'm doing what I should be doing and I feel okay about it, I've got like an internal steady state. So I generally feel quieter and I feel good about what I'm doing, but it's actually internal rather than external. So for me, high performance is about if I feel internally steady, then I'm doing my job well. If I start falling into the trap of all the other stuff, how well did that do? How many books have I sold? Is my followers growing all that rubbish? Then I know it's more dysfunctional. I mean, most of my clients nowadays are high performers and you know, they've got huge profiles and the interesting thing is that if I see somebody who's a top athlete or an A-list actor, often if they're struggling they'll talk about feeling empty or feeling not good enough or feeling that they still got stuff to prove and I guess really what you're trying to do is point out it's a bottomless pit. So if you're continually trying to feel better or show that you're good enough by achieving, doing more, getting the next award, getting the next win and hit, but it doesn't actually satisfy that internal stuff, then you're moving in the wrong direction. So I think you've always got to go inward and think, mm. OK, why am I doing it? Does That's it? scary though, Alan, of course because it's scary. all the money, all the fame, all the success, all the trappings yeah. for these high achieving individuals, they lie in that direction. But it, for most people, and I can say this confidently, for most people, that doesn't make them happy. And in my experience, kind of the more money people get, the more success they get, even the more fame and stuff people get, then the more they struggle. Because believe it or not, I mean, it's a payoff, isn't it? Because you get, and on one, at one level, you get all this achievement and success, but then at the other level, you get exposure. Mm. So the more exposure you get, I think, then the more vulnerable that you feel. It's almost like, I think of it like almost like an inner, inner wound. And I guess the more you put yourself out there and the more you achieve and the better you become, then you expose the wound a bit more. You know, and that fear that, okay, what if someone really finds me out? Or what if they work out that I'm not feeling good enough? So, of course, people then pile effort into, you know, to achieving more and doing more and being better. So it's about, it is a bottomless pit. I mean, for me, I mean, to, to sum it up in a nutshell, so I grew up in Belfast, so that was all about, you know, I just did a TED talk recently and it was called Bombs, Bullets and Bullying and a piano. So I was a little, you know, I played piano as a kid, but it was in working class Belfast, got a really tough time about that. I was also gay. I hadn't come out, obviously, as a kid, but realised I was different, got a really tough time. What age did you realise that? I probably realised about 11, to okay. be honest. But, you know, other kids are clever, you know, so they were all out kicking a football. I was playing piano you know, listening to show tunes, <laughs> all the cliches. And the kids worked it out, so I got a really rough time, particularly in secondary school, around being gay and stuff. And I guess a combination of that and then growing up in Northern Ireland, very, very working class roots, there was a whole thing about needing to prove that I was good enough. Mm. You know, and the bottom line was I felt rubbish. Most of my teenage years, I really felt, you know, I wasn't good enough, I was less than the other kids, so I was constantly trying to prove In what way? So what was the measures of good enough? I, for me, it was just about, it, it wasn't even about being good enough, actually. Now I said out loud, it was about fitting in and not being rejected. So that would have been enough, even not to be rejected and just fitting in would have been good enough for me. But that involved a lot of hard work. So then I realised that the more I stayed off radar and didn't disappoint people or didn't let them down, and then I discovered if I achieved and I did well and I was proven, you know, I was pretty good and 
that then I kind of thought, oh, that feels a bit good. You know, I was keeping my family happy. It was kind of keeping the spotlight off me a bit. So that's where I kind of learned, okay, well, if I can keep off radar and if I can just please people and achieve what I can, then that's pretty, it's keeping me safe, really. So that was my kind of early story. And then, of course, you crash land into adulthood and you realise, I'm still doing this crap. You know, even in your adult life, I'm still doing it. I'm still trying to achieve and succeed. And then luckily, I had a brilliant therapist in my early 20s and she was a Catholic nun, believe it or not. Someone gave me her name. They said her name's Kathleen, but they didn't tell me she was a nun <laughs> until I got there. And I'd just literally come out as gay wow. at the time and, and come out of a monastery, believe it or not. I was in a monastery for three years, training to be a priest. And is that what led you to see a therapist? Yeah, because right. I mean, I, you know, I did that at the time because I wanted to do a bit of good in my life. On hindsight, you know, I was just about to come out. I think getting into a monastery was a easy hideaway mm. at that time. So I left, came out, and I made a man said, why don't you go and talk to your therapist? Give me a name. And I get there, and it was in a school, and then this nun <laughs> came out, and she was like, oh, I'm Kathleen. And I was like, fucking hell. <laughs> What am I going to talk to a nun about? And she was brilliant. You know, she was really... And did you tell her you were gay? I, th- I didn't know. I, to be honest, I didn't go there at the beginning. Yeah. I remember going and she said to me, how are you doing? And I said, I'm good. And, you know, I said, oh, I think I'm okay. I'm fine. And, you know, and I kept telling I'm fine. I'm good. You know, everything. It's not too bad. And then at the very end, she let me go. And I talked for about an hour. And then at the end, she said to me, you keep mentioning that you're fine. And I said, yeah, I think I am. And she said, you don't look, you don't look fine to me and you don't sound it. And then I remember thinking, fuck, she's got me. And at that moment then, she said, do you want to start again? And then she said, come back next week, and then we, we started. Well, I didn't even know why I was there, to be honest. It was just like a mate said, look, you've got a lot of big stuff coming on here. I mean, you've got to put it into context as well. So, I mean, I'd been in a monastery for three years, came out, of the monastery and then literally was going to come out so one day my parents thought they had a pope on their hands yeah. and the next day later i was coming out to them so you can imagine was, the transition was going in the monastery a kind of a final attempt to not be gay if that makes sense i think it was a bit you know now i mean it, you know I'm, in my early 20s i hadn't got a clue what i was doing yeah. i went in it was a bit of a hideaway but i think now when i look back it was a safe option definitely because no one was going to question why I was there, no one was going to question why I wouldn't get married. Right. But it was good, I mean, it was a really good three years. I mean, it was, I mean, believe it or not, I mean, it was great. I've never, I've never stopped to really think brilliant. about I what... mean, you live in a monastery. I mean, naturally, you're in a big grey building and you've got your own room and stuff, but the work was great. You know, we did projects with drug addicts and I worked in a hospice for a couple of years. You're writing about doing homeless projects. Right. So the whole time you're busy and on the go doing stuff and then a bit of praying in between. It almost but, sounds like doing loads of good stuff to pay off for the fact that in your head you've been told there's a really bad thing lurking it's there, which point. is your sexuality. I, mean, I think it's a good point. I mean, there's that expression, there's no wounded healer. I think people yeah. who have been through a tough time often find a way of thinking, okay, well, how can I feel better? But that more importantly, how can I give stuff back? And I, I think these days it's more about giving back mm. than healing my own stuff. Yeah, so I mean, <laughs> what, what you're told is, I mean, as Catholics, you go to somewhere like Lourdes and, you know, people believe in it, so I'm not going to knock it because some people get a lot of comfort and fears yep. from it. But I went as a volunteer and, you know, people said, if you go on the water, you'll, you'll be healed and stuff. So I was like early 20s and I thought, I'll give that a go. And I went as a volunteer, did what I had to do with the volunteers. But you get to, you queue up, basically, it's like an into a swimming pool. And um, you sit in a chair and these people then dip you into the water like literally immerse you in water and then you come out again and the day when I was queuing up to go in all I remember was there was these two big French blokes who were like massive big guys they looked like two big rugby players and all I can remember is as they were dipping me into water I just looked at these two big guys with their muscles dipping me into water and all I could look at was the two blokes Right. and I remember thinking fucking hell I mean if I'm looking at the guys yeah. being dipped into the water and lured there's no hope you know, that's, that, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a no-brainer, really. I'm going to have to come out. But actually, that probably was a massive turning point as well. Because suddenly it was like, what the hell am I doing? I mean, this is not going to convert or change me. It's, so that was another yeah. big turning point into thinking, right, no, I need to, need to kind of start accepting myself a bit more. 
title took forever to get. We had loads of different titles. And I'd, I'd finished the book, couldn't, I don't know, we probably had about four working titles going and um, we were brainstorming because the first two books had 10 in them and we thought, well, should we have 10 in the third book? You know, how it is, you know, mm. people kind of think we want to yeah. market the book well. Just couldn't get a title to work. And we were talking one day and one of the publishers said, well, what are you trying to do with this book? And I said, well, I believe most people would benefit therapy. And I do believe that. But yeah. like having a personal trainer, we could all do yeah. a personal trainer. I believe most people will benefit therapy. But most people can't afford therapy. Or most people are on a wait list for like two, three years to get therapy. And I thought, well, what I want to do is just teach people. It's not a replacement for therapy, but I want to teach them how they can do it. 100%. Every client I work with, I mean, my goal, session one, if you were my client and you came to therapy, my goal would be that by the end, you don't need me. You know, that would be the goal. Because, of, you know, I don't work in an analytical way. I'm not with people for 20 years, keeping them on the couch, mm. talking. And there's nothing, you know, some people might need longer term therapy, but my belief is that most people know exactly what's going on for them. And they also know what they need to do. The beginning of therapy can be a bit like, a wrestling match because people will rock up depending on how ready they are and they will you know they'll give you the the polished version of their story and then the minute you start to then help them see the real story they'll push back and you then end up in this kind of push and pull for a bit until they're ready to do the work it's a good question i mean it depends on the context some people might hit a low point where they just are tired, feeling crap every day, just feeling low or anxious all the time, or just feeling lost. Other people will be a family member will push them along. I mean, I've had clients literally the wife or the husband will bring them. For for most people, what I'll say is, look, do you feel that you're you're as happy as you can be in your life? And you know, I think it's a good starting point. And I think most people will answer no to that. And if you're answering no to that question, then therapy will be a good thing. Because most people, I think, get in the way of their own happiness. They create obstructions, they create blocks unconsciously a lot of the time. And I think, you know, if you're living a life where you feel like you're on autopilot, you're just going through the motions or you're feeling dissatisfied or unhappy all the time, you know, either read the book or, you know, start therapy because you need to understand why you're doing that and why you're kind of existing rather than fully living. Normally when people come in, I mean, you want to keep it. I mean, often people come to therapy and they come with a whole load of notions about what it's going to be like. So I think they're often a bit shocked. I normally keep it really low key, very down to your earth, quite open and chatty at first. And I think they're normally surprised that it's, it's quite a chilled process. You don't want to frighten people off. So it's just a normal conversation. And then I'll often start by saying, oh, what brings you here? You know, how do you think I can help? And then that normally gets the story running. Now, <laughs> Probably for most people that will come along and say, I'm just thinking of a couple of clients, but people will often come and say, oh, I want to be more confident or I want help with public speaking or, you know, numerous examples. Uh, I just want to feel better or I want to be a better dad or whatever the context might be. And they'll start with a, a polite version of the yeah. story and then you get to session three and the real stuff comes. So, I mean, what they come with and what they deliver... <laughs> you know, two, three sessions in is normally a very, very different story. But it's my job to kind of, you know, dissect the important stuff and listen really carefully because, you know, we all do it. I mean, we're trained almost, we're hardwired to deliver the, the kind of polished version of who we are. That, you know, as human beings, we're all delivering the version that we want people to see. Yeah. And I guess therapy is almost like stripping off naked and saying, no, I'm not interested in the perfection. I'm not interested in how good you are or what you've achieved. I'm interested in who you are as a human being and what makes you tick. So I think if you think about it practically, I mean, we all have a brain in our head mm. and that's, you know, that's our thoughts and, and how, we, how we behave and our emotional state as well. So the reality is for most people, you crash land into adulthood and most people genuinely don't know how to manage their thoughts particularly negative critical thinking. Most people don't know how to manage difficult emotions. They spend most of their time trying to dumb them down, get rid of them, push them away. And most people struggle with behaviours that get in the way. So I guess really where I start with most people is, okay, let, let's look at how you're managing all of these parts of your life. So to give you a bit of context, you've got about 80,000 thoughts a day 
on average. That's what neuroscientists tell us. And about 60% of those are negative in nature, negative or critical. Now, that's a lot of, if you think about that, that's a lot of negative thinking for a human being to carry around in one day. But most people get caught into patterns where they just habitually think, well, this is just me. I'm a warrior or I'm self-critical or I doubt myself or... I see life for people as just a bit bleak and dark all of the time. So your first job really is to help people reconstruct the way they're thinking and help them to see that these are just patterns. And most of, you know, like 90% of what we worry about won't come to anything. But if you look at the the amount of time people spend worrying in their life, it's a lot of waste of time. I see it differently. It's never about removing the negative. Or, or just replacing it with a positive because the bottom line is life is always going to be both you know it can't be can't be positive all the time and with emotions for example I mean we all gravitate towards wanting to feel happy joyful successful peaceful mm. that, that's the emotions that we like but when, when it comes to the darker stuff when we feel fearful anxious low we try and push the, the, those emotions down where my argument would be well actually those emotions are trying to help you out they're, they're not there for a night. They're not accidental. Explain that. Yeah, well, negative emotions are they're part of normal human experience. So all of the ne- negative emotions, say, for example, Jake, you were having a really rough day and you were feeling flat and you were feeling a bit demotivated and, you know, there was stuff going on for you. Well, your instinct might be, I don't want to feel this way. So you might go off and do something to try yeah, and I'd push probably them. go to the gym. Go to the gym or yeah. do something to burn. But here would be my question. Well, what if that emotion is trying to communicate something? You know, what if it's trying to slow you down? What if it's trying to get you to reevaluate? What if it's trying to get you to look at your life in a different way? So often it's about mm. don't run away from the darker stuff. It's not going to harm you. It's not yeah. going to do anything terrible. Maybe it's trying to communicate something about change or how you can become a better human being. Or even from a performance point of view, how do you, you know how do you perform higher? The darker stuff will help you do that. can be, but I think even boredom in itself, I mean, if you're experiencing boredom regularly, then it's probably communicating, okay, but what, what, what are you doing with your life? You know, why are you bored so much? You know, do you want to think about, you know, reevaluating? Do you want to think about making changes in your life? So I think from, look, for me, the thing is, if, if all emotions can be seen as one rather than good and bad, and you can be curious about them, then you'll learn from them. And you'll grow. Whereas actually, if you focus all the time and energy and just going for the good stuff and the positive stuff, then you lose out all of that other stuff that's trying to help you out. And I see that a lot in therapy. There, there are three mechanisms called threat, drive and soothe that we're all driven by. So threat mechanism is literally your, your anxious brain. Mm. It's trying to protect you, trying to keep you safe. Drive mechanism is about succeeding, achieving doing more, being better. So they're not bad things. So a threat yeah. mechanism is helpful. It'll keep you safe. A drive mechanism is really, really useful because it can push us forward. But the other mechanism, soothing, is where we learn to quieten the internal stuff. You know, how we self-soothe, how we manage emotions, how we talk ourselves down when we're struggling. Most people, probably 95%, have no idea how to self-soothe. a good question and so it's a big question I mean I think t- teenagers just absolutely annihilate themselves I think the pressure they're under is enormous and I think social media and external factors play a big big part in that um, the biggest piece of advice I would probably give is don't believe all that you see because most of what we see online is magical and perfect and lovely you know as to don't believe all of that you know it's not real and um But like what I'd say to my own self really is that, you know, as you are is absolutely fine. The goal of the new would be, my advice would be don't make, you know, some of the mistakes I've made, which is about the external validation stuff. Go inward and find, find that internal steady state where you know that you're doing what you should be doing and it makes sense to you and it has value to you and trust in the process. I think the more you let go, the more the stuff that's meant to happen happens. I think the more you try to control it and fabricate it, then you end up going in a direction that may not necessarily be right for you. (laughs) 